We've got it, all right. As you can tell, I don't do this very much, all right? My name's Randy, I'm the missions pastor, so if you are a guest with us today, be back next week, because our pastor, Clint Ivey, who's sitting here on the front row heckling me, will be here preaching, and you need to hear him preach. I want to know where everybody came from, because like, I walked in right as, as Casey and the band started playing, and I sat down, and all the people that came to the 950 service showed up while my back was turned to you. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, all of you, for choosing uh, today, uh, July 4th Eve, as we've been calling it. We, uh, thank you for choosing to worship God here with us as we celebrate our nation's birthday. We appreciate you being here. I'm glad you are here. Those of you joining us online as well. Hey, I do want to introduce somebody to you. So if you're online, you may not see this, but Miriam, stand up for just a second. She's right back there in the middle. If you're in the room, I want you to see Miriam. She's standing up, I promise. All right, she waved to you. Miriam, you can have a seat. Hey, if you get a chance after this service, go meet her if you don't know her already. She's one of our missionaries. She's from Concord, and she is serving in Oregon at Portland State University. Been there about nine years serving faithfully, and is. As Brandon mentioned earlier, just when, when you want to talk about someone who is out in the trenches sharing the gospel with people who do not know Jesus, Miriam is doing that. So you make sure uh, following the service to go thank her for what she's doing, pray for her, let her know how much she means to us and, uh, and to Concord. And you know, maybe this is your first time around Concord, maybe you're joining us online for the first time, you know, Concord is a church where we want to help you. First off, we want to help you know God in an authentic and life-changing way uh, to carry out that great commission of Jesus by reaching others with the gospel. And, man, this was like, what, the third or fourth week in a row where we've gotten to celebrate baptism. We're seeing that throughout this summer more and more and more each week where we're seeing people coming to know Christ and going through believers' baptism. Hey, we also want you to know that life is better together, and we, we provide you a lot of ways to grow in community, as well as uh, while we're doing life together, we also want you to have a chance to serve Christ with your gifts. Now, I mentioned already, I'm the missions pastor, all right? So I get to help mobilize people going on mission trips. So this whole thing about serving Christ, that's a pretty big deal to me. And you may be sitting there going, well, I mean, what do I have to offer? Why, why would I go? Well, first off, let me tell you, I was, I was actually doing my quiet time this morning before I came. And I found myself in Exodus. And it was in a, a spot in Exodus where, where God was telling Moses, get everybody who has a gift to come, use their gift to build the temple. It's a great passage. But... We just got back from a mission trip to Mexico just, just a couple of weeks ago. And so I got one picture I want you to see. And uh, this is my youngest son, Daly. By the way, he got home late last night, so I didn't get to tell you that I was going to show pictures of you. So I apologize for that. He now knows there are pictures of him. But this is from two weeks ago. And this is, is Daly cutting boards for the house that we were building. Now, I got a confession to make. I go on a lot of mission trips and a lot of construction trips. I can't use a saw. All right, so I'm going to jump back a few a picture a few years earlier, and uh, this is my good friend Norman Turnipseed, and Norman is is teaching young daily at this point which side of the board to cut when you you mark it and how to measure it, and and Norman didn't leave it there. He went to this this next picture we have where he's standing right beside Daly as he's doing his very first cut ever on a saw. Norman actually corrects me. I, I know so little about saws. I call that a table saw. He's like, that's not a table saw. I said, well, it's a saw and there's a table. So to me, that's a table saw. Uh, but I've been corrected. That's not a table saw. But there's Norman 
uh, letting Daly cut his very first board ever. And so then we move on to, to the next one where he's a little bit older now and he is cutting wood by himself. Now what you can't see is about over here where I'm standing now is Norman staying very close to make sure he knows what he's doing. And then uh, a couple of months ago, back in uh, April, our students went. Uh, Daly was also a part of that trip, and he was able to, to help cut wood there. Now, I will tell you, I could do the exact same story. I don't have the pictures. I could do the exact same story with Brody Tyree. Because Brody, when he was about, well, he and Daly are the same age. They're both rising juniors in high school. But about that same time that Daly was learning from Norman Turnipseed, uh, Brody was learning from Gerald Fields. Now, there is one difference. Brody's dad knows how to use a saw, okay? Uh, but Mr. Gerald still took uh, uh, Brody under his wings to, uh, to show him what to do. By the way, this is a totally different note, but I want to show you one more picture. This is some of our students just a couple of weeks ago. There were actually seven of them on this roof. Now, it's unique, all right? We were building a house for a family in Mexico and the construction leader for another team, all right, they were not with Concord, we were staying in the same place and, and with the same ministry, but the building leader came to me right before lunch one day. He said, hey, we're really behind. Do you have anybody you could spare uh, to help put the shingles on the roof? And so at lunch we asked, asked our team if anybody would like to go help. Before we even finished asking them, Six rising juniors and uh, one rising freshman in college jumped up, put on their tool belts, and they headed up to do that. Not a single uh, adult was with them, but Jace Bowen uh, led that team, and in an hour and a half, they put every shingle on that house. And so, hey, I'll tell you, everything I've just said has absolutely nothing to do with today's sermon. But I'm the missions pastor, and Clint invited me to come up here and speak today. So I want to share with you how you can make a difference. You may think, man, what difference am I going to make on a mission trip? You know, Norman makes a difference. He, he cuts wood. But Norman made a huge difference not only in the lives of people that we were building for in Mexico. He made a difference in, in the life of our family. He taught a young kid how to operate a saw that now that he's, he's 16 is able to go down and, and cut every board that goes on a house that we're building. So... Again, that was all for free. I do want you to know that this is a church. Uh, we, we know God, we reach others, we grow in community, and we serve Christ. So if this is your first time at Concord, uh, or maybe it's the first time you've been here in a while, we're just so thankful that you're here. We're thankful that you chose to uh, worship with us today. And I want to welcome you and just tell you how excited I am. You're here to be a part of what we're doing today. Now, as Casey mentioned at the beginning, we're in a series called Summer Stories, and, and Clint invited me to, to share today, and you may not know me well, but those who do know me know I love to tell stories. Uh, it might be one of the only things where I really feel like I'm, I'm like Jesus, all right, because he, he told stories all the time to help point people to him, and I believe he's given me a lot of stories in my life so that I can help point people towards a relationship with Christ. So let's, let's recap real quick. All right, we're in our fourth week. Recap real quick. We started off, uh, we looked at uh, the Good Samaritan. After that, we looked at, at the Ten Talents. And then last week, uh, we found ourselves in the parable where we looked at the speck and the log, all right, in our, in our own eye. Don't see the speck in someone else's because we can't from the log that's in our own, all right? So today, you can go ahead and turn in your Bible. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew 8, and we're actually going to read, I'm sorry, Matthew 18. We're going to read quite a few verses, so you're going to get to stand back up again, because we, we do that in reverence to God's Word. And you're going to be standing for a few minutes, but then I promise you, you can sit down for the rest of the time I'm up here, all right? So Matthew 18, let's stand in reverence to God's Word. We're going to camp out here for a few, few minutes. Uh, verse 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven 
may be compared to a king who wished a, uh, to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servant saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and asked uh, and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Uh, again, that as we've already prayed, that you allow us to be in this room worshiping you with freedom, Father. We praise you for that. But Father, this, this can be a tough passage to read. And so Father, I pray that right now you would open our ears. Let us hear what you have for each one of us individually today. Thank you for your word. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Here, here's kind of the question that we want to, to answer today as we talk through this passage. How does Jesus expect me to handle a situation where someone has wronged me? You know, we're never more like God than when you forgive. But how do we do it? And so today, what I'm going to do, we're going to go through three points and we'll we'll go through them fairly quick and you can go get ready to grill hot dogs or hamburgers or barbecue or whatever it is uh, that you've got planned for today and tomorrow but if you'll hang with me for these three points uh, we'll talk through a few things uh, of how God wants to help us learn to forgive so the first thing is forgiveness is not a feeling it's a choice if you look back at those verses again beginning in 21 it says then Peter came up and said to him Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. And, and Jesus says to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him and he owed him 10,000 uh, talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold. He's going to sell him with his wife, with his kids, with all he owned. And that's how he was going to pay him back. But he falls down to his knees, have patience with me. I'll pay you everything. And out of pity, he's forgiven. The debt's forgiven. But that same servant goes out, finds somebody that owes him money, starts choking him. And he says almost the exact same thing, right? Have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. That's tough, all right? You know, if, if you're waiting till you feel ready to forgive someone, you are fighting an uphill battle. It's against our human nature to forgive, isn't it? And by using the, the phrase 70 times 7, Jesus is actually referencing a passage out of Genesis where, where Lamech is, has used that same phrase to mean something totally opposite. In fact, he was using it in terms of revenge and vengeance. Uh, and that's our natural inclination, is revenge and vengeance. We want someone to feel the hurt that they have caused us. And so Jesus is challenging us to 
to enter this process of a continued, never-ending cycle of forgiving. And, and there's a huge irony because he, he uses 10,000 talents. Now, I'm not as, as studied, all right, as some of our guys on staff. So I had to go to Google, right? What is 10,000 talents? Well, I found out Google actually doesn't even know because every one I looked at was a little bit different. But, and they ranged from uh, one was $4 million, one was $10 million. It went as high as $40 million. That might have been taking into account gas these days. I don't know. Uh, but, but anywhere from, from $4 to $10 million, um, $4 million to $10 million, but yet the, the, the king forgave the servant. And it, it was obvious that the servant was not going to be able to pay the 10,000 talents back, right? He couldn't do it. And so then, then his own buddy comes along and he owes him, uh, you know, uh, basically a, a, a few thousand dollars. And yet he doesn't forgive him. Now, that also, he, he, he throws him in jail until he can pay him back, quoted, right? You're in jail till you can pay me back. Which is, by the way, also impossible to pay back if you're in jail. You're not earning a wage. I told you I love to tell stories. So before I saw this firsthand. I've seen this firsthand. Before we moved uh, to, to North Georgia, uh, our family, I, well, I got a call one day from my wife. She would always pick up the kids and get home about an hour, hour and a half before I did. And she called, and, and I remember the words, hey, I think somebody broke into our house. And so I, I jumped in the car and I, I sped home and she and the, the boys were at our neighbor's house across the street just kind of standing in the, the driveway and I, I jumped out of the car and I ran around to the back door and I thought, she thinks we got broken into? I mean, they busted our door in, the door frame was out in the kitchen and, and, and the guy had stolen uh, several things. He, he stole the, the game cube that Santa had just brought he uh, stole some cameras. I was actually excited. We needed a new computer, so I thought, ah, maybe he stole that. I walked around the corner. Nope, he didn't take that. Um, so we still had the same computer. But, you know, fortunately, he, he was caught within actually about a week. And he had broken into several houses in our neighborhood, a couple of others in, in the city. Uh, for our house alone, uh, between the damage and what he had taken, it was, it was I don't know, it was around $7,000 uh, between everybody, I mean, there was one house between damage and, and goods taken, it was around $30,000. And so there was all this money, and he went to jail. We used to get, they finally quit sending them to us, but we used to get restitution checks, right? And we would literally, every, every few months, we would get a check for $1.53. And I'm thinking, how long, I mean, we're in it for $7,000. How, he, He's not going to live long enough to pay this back. He was also in jail. It's impossible. And so if you, you read this and, and you look at both servants who have said, I'll pay it back, both were, were going to be paying back something that was impossible for them to do. And then in verse 35, so also my heavenly Father will do to you if each of you does not forgive your brother from your heart. You know, the... If you look at that word heart, the, the Hebrew concept of heart is very different than our concept. You know, we categorize uh, heart with feelings, and then we use uh, mind with logic and decisions. And for Hebrew, the, the heart did both of these things, you know, meaning you, you must choose to forgive, and then your feelings will follow. Hey, I don't know, I don't know if you saw the story that came out of Alabama this past week. Uh, but uh, two deputy sheriffs were, were chasing a guy who had stolen a car. He was a convicted felon. He had stolen a car. He ended up shooting both of them. Uh, one of them tragically lost his life. Uh, the other spent a, a couple of days in the hospital. He got out uh, Thursday evening, and I, I read this article last night, but he said, to the dude who shot me, I forgive you for what you've done to me. But what you've done to my friend, I can't say I forgive you yet. And he goes on to say, he says, We serve a mighty, just God that I know can change my mind and my heart, but you took my friend. So here's a guy that's, that's realized, okay, 
I'm supposed to forgive you, and in, in, in my heart, I can forgive you for this, but I can't forgive you for everything. And so I, I read a book recently, I actually read it a few years ago, uh, of a guy going through that journey of truly forgiving. And so uh, Craig Rochelle wrote a book a few years ago called The Christian Atheist. Remember last week we talked about not judging? Don't judge the title, okay? Don't judge me for, for that. Don't, don't judge Craig Rochelle because the other part of the title is the Christian atheist. But it goes on to say, believing in God but living as if he doesn't exist. And so in one of the chapters, Craig Rochelle, he talks about forgiveness, but he, he goes way back in his life and he talks about a, a family friend named Max who ended up doing something to Craig's younger sister. Something that was obviously very hurtful. I mean, you can figure out exactly what he had done. And, and, and Craig writes several things. He says, to say that I wanted Max to die and burn in hell doesn't even begin to convey how much I wanted him to suffer. Although the words rage, hate, and revenge come to mind when I think about Max, the English language simply doesn't have a word for what I felt. He says, we know as Christians we're supposed to be forgive, but many of us Christian atheists think that there are exceptions to this rule. Sure, we should forgive most of the time, maybe even almost all of the time, but forgive a guy like Max? Forget it. And so he, he talks about the bitterness he felt for years towards Max, and, and he gets to a point in his life where, where he says, as I sat in church one Sunday, my pastor preached a convicting message on forgiveness, explaining how we should release those who have wronged us. As he read the words from Scripture commanding me to forgive, everything in me screamed, no, I don't want to forgive Max. I refuse to release him. My pastor preached on, and God ever so slowly chipped away at the rough edges of my heart. He goes on to talk a little more about the process that he was feeling on forgiveness. And he gets down to a, a point. He says, I knew I was supposed to forgive Max for what he did to my sister, but I honestly didn't have a clue how to do it. God had convicted me and convinced me to begin. God, I pray for you to work in his life. But Max's actions still seemed unforgivable. He goes on to say, the answer is simple but the furthest thing from easy. Colossians 3.13 teaches us to forgive as the Lord forgave you. He says, I was torn between wanting to obey God and wanting just as much to continue hating. I wrestled mightily in prayer with these verses, still swimming in a pool of pain and bitterness. I decided it was time to try to forgive Max. Notice, I use the word decided. That was a decision based on my choice to obey Scripture. Not a decision on whether I felt like forgiving. Nothing in me felt like forgiving, but I still made the choice to try. It goes on to say, my heart was stone hard, and only God could soften it to the point that I could even consider forgiving, forgiving this, uh, this guy. To this day, I don't know exactly how or when it happened, but it did. By God's grace, I had forgiven Max for his sin and abuse. With God's help, I'd done the humanly impossible, and I felt as though a spiritual weight had been lifted. The Bible became clear. God seemed nearer. My heart was pure. He goes on to share that, that he found out that Max had, had muscular dystrophy and was, was bedridden. And he decided it for him, and we don't all do this, but for him, for Craig Rochelle, he needed to write a letter to Max to let him know, I forgive you. And so he did that. And he, he goes on to say that he didn't realize that his uh, muscular dystrophy had gotten to the point that, that his, his eyes weren't working. And so it turns out he had a caregiver who he asked to read this note. A few months after, after Max had passed away, the caregiver came and... and and uh, explained uh, how Max's uh, eyesight had deteriorated. He had asked her to read the note. Uh, although she wasn't aware of what he had done, and Groeschel goes on to say he never told her, it was obvious to her that he had done something grievously wrong. According to the nurse, he listened 
with tears streaming down his face. He asked her to pray the prayer with him. She recalled that his whole countenance changed as he asked Christ to forgive him and make him new. A few days later, he died, and and I'll end with this on on the book. He, He says, we Christian atheists can rationalize as many excuses as we need to avoid forgiving. We Christians, however, can find in God the sheer strength to battle through the feelings of anger, hatred, and bitterness and fight our way back to the cross. That's where Christ forgave us. And that's where, by faith, we can find the ability to forgive those who've wronged us. Wow. So forgiveness isn't a feeling, it's a choice. But our next point is forgiveness might require some help. You know, it's, forgiveness isn't condoning or, or excusing or even tolerating uh, when somebody's wronged you. Forgiveness doesn't mean being a doormat. Uh, right before this parable, in fact, Jesus teaches us the, the process for going to someone when they've hurt you. And so uh, back in, in verse 15, it says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Go by yourself. Tell him, you've wronged me. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two to three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. So there were kind of like four things there, he, four steps, right, if somebody's wrong. This. First off, you confront them privately. Second, you go to them uh, with, with some others. You bring others into the situation. Third, you go to your church family. And fourth, they become like a tax collector to you, all right? And, and by the way, when you choose to forgive someone, Um, or not to forgive someone, you are affecting yourself. Unforgiveness, it creates this emotional storm of distress which which actually uh, causes stress and anxiety, depression, insecurity, and even fear surface. Unforgiveness causes a hardened heart and, and that hardened heart feels that anger and resentment and bitterness. You know, there was actually a a study done at Harvard, and I'll be honest, I can't even like come close to pronouncing the doctor's name who wrote up the study, but this study is a secular study done at Harvard, And, and listen to this quote. He says, practicing forgiveness can have powerful health benefits. Observational studies and even some randomized trials suggest that forgiveness is associated with lower levels of depression, anxiety, and hostility, reduced substance abuse, higher self-esteem, and greater life satisfaction. So even the secular world gets that forgiveness is powerful for us. It makes a difference in our lives. So we've seen that forgiveness is not a feeling. We've seen uh, that it's a choice. We've, We've determined forgiveness might require us to get some help from some others. So now the third point, forgiveness is impossible without mercy. And this this parable truly shows what mercy looks like, the act of not receiving what you actually deserve. It's it's a continued giving up of my right to retaliate. It may be something that you're dealing with on a daily basis, choosing every day to walk in that forgiveness. It's choosing to change my heart towards others by offering compassion instead of hatred. You know, I showed you a picture at the beginning of a trip just a few weeks ago when we went to Mexico. Now, before that trip, just like I do on a lot of trips when I'm going to be on an airplane, I decided to download a few movies uh, to watch on the plane. And so one title jumped off at me. I honestly didn't even know that it was going to connect to what I was preaching in a few weeks. Uh, But it was a movie called Amish Grace. And, and it was actually a pretty good movie. Now, I will tell you, until I started researching to see if this movie was accurately correct, I didn't realize that it was a, a Lifetime Network movie. 
I've never watched the Lifetime Network. I don't know if I have to turn in my man card for watching that movie. Uh, but it was actually a good movie. And, and if you go back, it was uh, the year 2006, and a lot of you might remember it. Uh, there was a school shooting in an Amish community. And it was a little one-room school. Uh, and a guy went in and, and shot several uh, children in this, this Amish community. But as I said, I wanted to know, is it true? So I, I went in, I found an article. Uh, about and, and by the way, apparently the movie was very factual. There were, were a couple of li- liberties that they took, but for the most part, it was very factual. But listen to a, just a couple of excerpts from this movie. Uh, the, the survivor said that the, 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 the shooter told them he was angry at God because his baby daughter had died despite his prayers. Now, as he went in, he, he actually... Uh, went in this this one-room school and he had all the the girls in the class stay and he he allowed the boys to leave and it was because of that anger in his mind they realized that his plan was to to shoot all the girls in retaliation because God didn't answer my prayer and on the day of the killings this article said members of the the Nickel Mines community took food to Robert's widow. Many of those who took food were those who had actually lost a child that day. They took food to his widow. Six days after the shooting, some of those same families had just buried their daughters. They attended Robert's funeral. Money from funds that poured in from around the world uh, was diverted to his family even though many of those victims faced huge medical bills. Aaron Esch Sr., one of, one of the men in the community, he said the bereaved parents started to look at forgiveness as the one good thing that can come out of this tragedy. And with Robert's dead, he said, uh, there was nowhere for the anger to go. There had been no foreshadowing of his ghastly act He was known only as a loving father, a loving husband, and a good neighbor. Now, the Amish believe, the article said, that that harboring anger and resentment is corrosive. And and Esh uh, went on to say, it will eat you up. Forgiveness, he said, is so ingrained in our heritage that it's part of our character. Now, another... Another one of the men in the community whose name also I can't, can't completely pronounce, his first name is Chris, he, he recalled the shock of the day 10 years ago when he, like the Fishers, had to deal with, with the news that one of his daughters was dead and one wounded. He too chose to forgive. But you see, he said, it's a journey. I still made that immediate choice in principle. But it took me a few years until I could feel that I really meant it inside me to forgive Charlie. At that point, when he did uh, find the compassion, he said, I felt a great weight falling off of me. I felt lighter. And he goes on to say, that feeling does not arrive if you forgive merely out of obligation. So, you know, In fact, if you would, just go ahead and and, and bow your heads, close your eyes. You know, that these actions, all of these actions I've talked about today, they were shown to us clearly by by Christ, by Jesus. Not only did he give up his right to to retaliate against his enemies, he died for them. I think so often of, of him, he's praying in that garden of Gethsemane, and he knows what's coming. And yet, he chooses, even before the act, to forgive. He offered compassion to us instead of condemning us. And you know, in, in Romans 5, verse 8, very clearly says, But God demonstrates his own love for us, in that while we were still sinners, he died for us. You know, so, so there are a couple of, of action points as you're, your heads are bowed. A couple of action points. First off, you may be sitting here and, and uh, you have not chosen to make Christ Lord of your life. So we're going to have some, 
some prayer warriors down here at the front in a few moments and they would love to talk to you about that next step of, of making him Lord of your life so that, that you can experience the forgiveness that he promises for your sins so we can help you take that next step to just as Wyatt did here a little earlier to, to believers baptism that as Jamie pointed out that's not what saved Wyatt what saved Wyatt was the decision he made in a room with his parents just, just a couple weeks ago. But it may be for, for the Christian is, is just an opportunity to walk out of here better. Maybe you have unforgiveness in your heart. And so what I've asked Casey and our team to do today after I pray is just to play for a moment. So we'll have some music and this, this altar will be open. And maybe you have some unforgiveness in your heart that, that you want to just come lay at this altar. Hey, we talked about judgment last week, so nobody's judging you for what you come down to this altar to pray. Maybe you want to talk to one of these same uh, prayer warriors and get some help laying down the unforgiveness in your life. So I'm going to pray, and then we're just going to take a few moments to, to sit in the moment to come to this altar to deal with things that you need to deal with in your life if you're online with us you can do it right there there's nothing magical about being in the room at this altar it's a great place to lay it down but you can do that right in your room where you're, you're listening to this message Father we do Father I, I know I've struggled over the years with, with bitterness and unforgiveness and so Father I just I pray that at this moment you would speak to each and every one of us in this room speak to our hearts Father help us come to you right now to get help for giving others Father forgive us for not doing that as you've so clearly demonstrated Father for the, the person in this room for the people in this room who may not know you may not have asked you to lead their life, to be Lord of their life. Father, I pray you'd give them the strength to step out of that aisle, come down forward, talk to one of those who are uh, gathered in the room, uh, who are standing here in the front just to pray with them. Father, we praise you for what you're going to do during this time, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.